Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining me today to talk about uh, knowledge graphs. Um, what we're going to end up doing is uh, I'll give you a, a quick introduction to uh, Neo4j, uh, who we are, what we've been doing of late, uh, and then uh, we'll dive into uh, our definition uh, of knowledge graphs themselves, and then I'll give you a slew of examples of where they're being applied and uh, what the ultimate uh, outcome and capabilities of, uh, of knowledge graphs actually uh, uh, are. And then we'll talk a little bit about where we see uh, knowledge graphs moving into the future and uh, really becoming a, uh, uh, a core element of an infrastructure to, uh, to really make sure that we're maintaining the institutional memory or the corporate memory of the organization. So let's begin real quick and uh, a, uh, a discussion about who Neo4j is and what uh, what we have been doing. Uh, we are the, uh, the graph platform and we focus on connected data or the relationships amongst different data entities. So uh, we're an enterprise grade uh, native platform that uh, allows you to uh, not only store but reveal and then query and use uh, data relationships in your applications and uh, uh, within your infrastructure. What's really cool about it is we allow you to both traverse and analyze uh, this connectedness uh, at any level of depth, uh, and it all happens in real time because oftentimes you uh, you may find that uh, uh, the six degrees of separation between one data element and another isn't far enough to go. Perhaps you have to go 20 degrees away to really gain that context or that uh, a core understanding of how a couple of things are interrelated to each other. Uh, and that's what uh, the graph database and the graph platform really allow you to do. And ultimately, this allows you to add context and connect new data on the fly or connect uh, new discovery or, or new pieces of information to build out that overall knowledge, institutional knowledge, that knowledge that the, uh, the graph contains. And uh, you know, on, the, uh, on the technology side and the core kind of focus of what we're, what we're doing is we build the graph platform we're designed. Uh, we're designing this for uh, core enterprises. We're designing it for very high performance. We are obsessive about uh, maintaining data integrity and acid transactions. Uh, the beauty of the graph it is really agile in terms of how it gets developed and how it gets evolved. Uh, we're supporting analytics and new forms of graph algorithms, and really trying to drive the entire industry forward in a learning and adopting uh, this graph platform and this graph technology. So knowledge graphs themselves in this age of connections, what we're really seeing is that core next wave of advantage of what you're going to be able to do is really going to be heavily driven on how you recognize and how you interconnect the different data elements, perhaps the different data silos that you happen to have and, and be living with today. So this next wave of advantage is all is going to be all about how the consumer data is related and what you know uh, uh, what information they they may end up uh, uh, a customer or consumer might end up buying as as product information and then how that relates to how they go and uh, uh, pay for or uh, uh, pay for those products how they describe those products how those products themselves are manufactured etc. All of these exercises across all of these different uh, data silos are indeed interconnected. And that's really what Neo4j is attempting to highlight as we, um, uh, uh, as we embark upon our uh, discussion of uh, you know, why graphs themselves are so important. So when you look at a graph perspective versus a, let's say, a traditional discrete data or relational data kind of problem, uh, your discrete, discrete data operates, you know, your RDBMS operates in a tabular format. So you have rows and records of, uh, of, of uh, tabular data, whereas connected data and connected data problems are all about how those data elements indeed are related to each other. So a relational database architecture would store things in tables, we store things as a uh, graph, and then of course the vehicles that we use to access all of this, uh, you might use SQL for a relational uh, exercise, you would use a, a language called like Cypher, uh, which is the uh, declarative language that uh, Neo4j uh, uses as, uh, uh, as its query vehicle. And you can see it's very descriptive even in terms of uh, how it presents the information that it's, that it's querying. Uh, and of course, has a relationship. She loves Dan. So I want to talk a couple of seconds about some of the uh, different 
uh, customers that we have that are building knowledge graphs and using them in uh, in major major ways in terms of uh, uh, helping them define new projects, uh, helping them uh, uh, uncover uh, a variety of unrelated information and, and really revealing that. So my first use case I want to talk about uh, very quickly is NASA. Uh, the the NASA has been using uh, Neo4j as the foundation for its uh, mission uh, mission history uh, uh, database. And what this is, is it takes all of the accumulated knowledge of every launch uh, and, and every, uh, every pre-launch uh, uh, test that NASA has performed over the last 40 or 50 years and has developed a knowledge graph about that information. And what that allows them to do is more expeditiously uh, uh, trace back situations that uh, uh, where problems may may have occurred in the past, they can uh, perform better root cause analysis there. They can uh, identify better uh, uh, types of solutions using uh, perhaps suggesting alternative materials or alternative uh, um, uh, configurations for different pieces of equipment, such that uh, uh, in the exercise of getting um, uh, getting both into space, uh, in fact, and getting to uh, and exploring areas like uh, uh, getting the uh, the mission to Mars off the ground, the graph database that NASA is using is is saving them roughly two years worth of research time in terms of uh, you know, having to go back and review where issues were, what decision making process where processes were occurring, how can they expedite those or eliminate. Uh, uh, issue areas altogether and create the uh, the, the safest uh, uh, space travel and, and, and space exploration that uh, uh, that's possible. Let's move to uh, another uh, 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 very pertinent today kind of uh, customer, the uh, International Consortium of Investigative Journalists. Uh, back in April of this year, they won the Pulitzer Prize. They won the Pulitzer Prize for their Panama Papers investigation. And Panama Papers, what that was, was a quick, was a very deep investigation uh, of a, uh, a born from a Snowden style document leak that uh, uh, delivered over 11 and a half million documents or 2.6 terabytes of data from a law firm called Mossack uh, Fonseca. And what that law firm was doing was creating tax shelters for a variety of different um, uh, 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 celebrities, politicians, etc., and uh, what ICIG was be, was able to reveal were uh, how and where and 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 uh, uh, where money was uh, was flowing and uh, and going with the uh, with regard to this uh, Panama Papers leak. And they've actually this Panama Papers was their third major investigation of uh, where financial institutions and, and finances are getting uh, uh, routed uh, typically into the Caribbean or different uh, uh, offshore accounts from a variety of the, uh, like I said, these uh, politicians, celebrities, gangsters, et cetera, were uh, involved in the uh, Panama Papers leak. So Panama Papers, uh, what had happened out of, out of that to date is uh, not only that Pulitzer Prize uh, uh, won for uh, ICIJ in all of the uh, uh, nearly 400 reporters involved in the exercise, but it led to the prime ministers of Iceland and Pakistan resigning. It exposed uh, financial holdings of uh, uh, Vladimir Putin, of other prime ministers, of, as, as I mentioned, gangsters, celebrities like uh, Lionel Messi, uh, where, where their uh, uh, financial holdings happened to be. And unfortunately, uh, uh, about uh, a month ago, it also led to uh, uh, the unfortunate assassination of one of the journalists involved in this exercise uh, in Malta, and, and, and for that we're very, very sorry. But what this has led to also is this week's announcement of the Paradise Papers. The Paradise Papers continues in the same form, but now has also added to the original uh, document database that uh, and knowledge graph that uh, ICIJ had, had put together. They've now assembled uh, new leaks from uh, Appleby, which is a hundred-year-old tax sheltering law firm that uh, uh, they, they had obtained uh, 
uh, million new documents and, and new account records, and they've been matching that not only with the information that they had in previous investigations, but also have extended that data with uh, public business registration information from countries across the Caribbean. So they're taking publicly available data, registration, corporate registrations and, and the like, and matching that up with uh, these tax sheltering uh, uh, documents that uh, derive from, uh, from Appleby and have once again exposed all kinds of new behaviors or uh, uh, created new degrees of transparency uh, with regard to what they're characterizing as the 1% elite. So what we're seeing in the course of three days, uh, this was released on Sunday night, uh, what we're seeing right now is they've exposed things like the tax sheltering practices of Apple and Nike and where uh, uh, when they are, are identified as um, keeping billions of dollars that of, uh, of their profits offshore, this expose, this describes, I won't even say exposed, this describes how they're doing that. And even when they hit particular issues like uh, Ireland, where uh, uh, much of Apple's uh, uh, investment was being held when Ireland started to close their tax loopholes. Um, uh, Apple moved to a, a different island and uh, has uh, uh, continued to uh, uh, to keep their uh, their their profits uh, uh, safe from government access. Now, of course, as an Apple shareholder, I think that's magnificent. They're they're doing exactly what I would expect them to do. Um, this has also helped reveal hidden connections amongst politicians amongst nation states. Uh, uh, the popular one this week is uh, the Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross and his uh, uh, couple of hops away relationship uh, identified or, or holdings, common holdings identified with uh, Vladimir Putin's son-in-law, which is uh, uh, creating um, uh, murmurs of investigations around here. And really, uh, there's other a number of other folks involved. There's uh, uh, holdings from the Queen of England and, uh, and what those investments ultimately are uh, 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 reinvested in. There's uh, uh, the Prime Minister of Canada, uh, uh, Trudeau's finance, uh, uh, top financier, is also uh, 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 involved in, in these uh, uh, Paradise Paper investigations. But within what's really interesting so far is even within two days, right, this is triggered tax evasion investigations in, listen to all these countries, in the United States, in the UK, across Europe, in India, Australia, uh, within the, uh, the nation states themselves, Bermuda, uh, Canada, Cayman Islands, all of these or, uh, uh, governments, the, typically the IRA, uh, their tax recovery uh, uh, investigations have begun simply based on uh, information that has been revealed in Paradise Papers. And this is this again is going to be an ongoing uh, uh, investigation with reveals almost on a daily basis, right? ICIJ has been talking about delivering this information, uh, uh, new breakthroughs every single day as they move forward here. So this is the fourth major investigation of ICIJ into the financial holdings of, of folks uh, throughout the world. Um, and of course, the core underlying technology that's driving and making these connections available to these uh, to these uh, uh, journalists and, and users is near for js data platform a, a graph platform is uh, uh, the underpinnings of this and then partners such as link curious are the uh, the vehicles that are actually revealing and describing it in a visual way so that the reporters them, themselves have something very easy to navigate and understand how uh, uh, these particular connections of relationships of account holdings etc are indeed uh, uh, involved together. So as we look at the, you know, that, that, that's an example, just one example, a really big high profile example uh, going on today um, regarding the expectations of how graphs were going to get developed and used uh, uh, throughout the, uh, uh, over the last couple of years. So if I look back and I review, you know, let's say analyst expectations of, of like three years ago, um, Gardner's recognizing that this uh, that graphs are going to be the single most competitive differentiator for an organization. Revealing those connections is so important. Uh, but then by the end of 2018, that's next year, they're, they're expecting 70% of organizations will have one or more pilot or proof of concept underway. And then Forrester, uh, uh, back three years ago, it was estimating that more than 25% of enterprises will be using graphs by 2017. Well. Uh, let's look at kind of the just the, the basic Neo4j statistics. 
We've experienced over 10 million downloads and Docker pulls of Neo4j so far. We're looking at, uh, uh, we've had over 100,000 uh, classroom registrants and meetup members that are uh, uh, that have gone and, and signed up for, uh, for particular meetups. We have uh, just recently, back in October, uh, we had more than 1,000 attendees at the uh, Graph Connect New York City. Uh, 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 enjoying the uh, the overall world of uh, we have more than 40 customers present at uh, at Graph Connect as well. Uh, we're running more than a uh, uh, a graph event um, a day, or, or that is getting run uh, uh, more than one event a day. And in, in these annual events, they have tens of thousands of attendees that are showing up at these uh, uh, different uh, uh, meetups, trainings, uh, um, uh, graph days, etc. Uh, we have more than uh, 100 uh, technology service provider uh, uh, partners, and then we're uh, enjoying, we've got over 250 customers, half of which are from the Global 2000 or billion dollar and above kind of customers. And we've got uh, uh, more than 500 startups that, that are using Neo4j in some form as they build their own core sets of products and platforms. So you can see the, uh, the, the, the list of organizations that are adopting graph technology is indeed uh, taking off quite heavily, whether that's in the technology space, financial services, performing retail recommendations. We'll get into a little bit of that in a minute. Uh, in, in media, in social, uh, telco, and, uh, and healthcare, uh, as well as governments, the, the security and, and, uh, uh, and, and anti-fraud and uh, identity management are all very, very big uh, activities that uh, a variety of national governments are using graphs for. Users really are enjoying uh, uh, the, uh, the the graph experience uh, themselves. Cipher, as I said, is very easy to to, uh, to learn and use, and we'll get into a little bit more of that in a moment. Um, but it's a, a, an area where uh, uh, users themselves are the ones that are, are are driving the the fandom or the fan base of, of both Neo4j and the use of, of graphs. Now, what I really wanted to get to here was a recognition that uh, when I said Forrester. Uh, had uh, been been calling out that uh, uh, 25 percent by 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 today, 25 percent of organizations would be uh, using Graph. And in fact, their one of their most recent studies demonstrates that over half of uh, the global uh, 2000 are indeed deploying Graph already. Uh, and then another 20 uh, 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 over two thirds are, of, of their surveyed. Respondents are deploy are, are planning on uh, deploying graph uh, or have deployed graph in some form um, And uh, of course the great quote here is Neo4j is the dominant player in the graph market. That's uh, very recently uh, released uh, information from their uh, Market overview on graph database vendors themselves so why are we? Uh, uh, succeeding here when uh, uh, in, within the, the graph market. And I think it really uh, operates on a number of different areas and it's a, because of a number of different areas. One is overall adoption uh, and simplifying the exercise of adopting a graph, driving awareness of, of graph capabilities itself, and the overall impact and benefit that the, the graphs are having on organizations. So if we look at our business model, uh, we have an open source business model that's, that has core commitment to developers, uh, both from a standpoint of releasing uh, on a regular, regular basis the software itself, uh, and then we have a very active developer relations organization, training events, as I just mentioned. And then our commitment to sharing Cypher as the sequel for graphs uh, under the Apache 2 license and through a variety of, uh, of, of different technologies, we're seeing a number of vendors adopt Cypher as their graph uh, a standard query language, including SAP HANA Graph, uh, Redis, uh, we have MemGraph, we have another vendor called Agents Graph, uh, and we're seeing a, a growing and growing adoption of Cypher as a technology and a technology toolkit. Recently, we, we released Cypher for Apache Spark, uh, which is another uh, uh, capability here of uh, allowing you to use, uh, you know, turn Spark, uh, its in-memory calculation capabilities into a uh, graph traversal and graph analytic uh, environment using Cypher uh, as the uh, as the core language to assemble your and distill your graphs. Uh, the technology leadership that we're seeing is, you know, again, that core commitment to data integrity, I think, is uh, 
uh, uh, one of the, the absolute tenets of, that Neo4j represents is the data has to be, uh, when it's going into the graph, it has to be uh, uh, ACID uh, transaction uh, compliant. Uh, if it's not, you're going to get a corrupt graph and a, and a useless graph very, in very, very short order. Uh, and we're expanding our, our uh, commitment to a variety of user uh, audiences. That includes data scientists. It includes IT and business analysts and business users. That's really some of the core message that we have uh, just announced in the uh, graph platform announcement that we came out with uh, back in uh, back in October here. So referring to the graph platform itself, a couple of highlights of this. I'm not going to go through very much. Uh, I want to talk specifically about the uh, knowledge graph use cases, but uh, do want to at least highlight that uh, we are trying and our intent is to be driving relationships and, and understanding and use of graphs beyond the developer community in my upper left-hand corner there to working all the way through uh, big data environments, working all the way through to uh, data analysts, data scientists, uh, and giving uh, uh, graph analytic both tooling and analytic capabilities uh, uh, within the environment such that uh, uh, we can perform things like uh, uh, cluster detection or uh, page rank and centrality uh, or path routing kinds of algorithms. So you really get a much more robust uh, dimension or perspective on, on your data that you may not uh, readily have if you're uh, simply using a, a traditional uh, analytic methods. And then coming up with ways to, uh, uh, typically through partners, to visualize, discover, and explore graphs for, uh, for business users. So really the, the, the core message here is we're trying to drive the overall adoption and the, uh, uh, the uptake of graphs itself by reaching deeper into the enterprise and, and, and creating uh, support for more users, uh, larger sets of roles and more use cases within the graph environment. So I'm gonna, I wanna illustrate a couple of you know, the, uh, the roles in the enterprise that we're, we are indeed addressing. Like the developer themselves, we're, we're typically building real-time graph traversal applications there. Those are things like recommendation engines, fraud detectors, um, uh, 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 you know, real-time data retrieval and, and uh, in, in this knowledge graph space. But then we're also seeing that those applications are indeed thirsty for more data and more connections. I think what you will find as you use a graph is that having more connections available to you will drive a lot more uh, uh, interesting both discovery and uh, uh, um, uh, development of innovations and development of knowledge. So adding more data through data lakes and data warehouses is a big deal. Uh, involving data scientists, because when you add new data to a graph, oftentimes that's going to trigger the, uh, the need for new uh, algorithmic exercises. And uh, as the data scientists develop new algorithms, they in turn uh, make them available back to the application developers. We characterize this somewhat as a uh, uh, our, our artificial intelligence kind of workflow loop. Uh, the application gets built, it gets deli it, uh, it, it works, it gets hungry for more data, more data drives new algorithms, new algorithms feed the intelligence of the, uh, of the deployed graph and actually help make it smarter while it's operating is it's really the premise there. But then you can see as, as we kind of build that out, that first work loop that I was describing was just simply the, the interaction between those application developers, our data hub and, and big data architecture people and data scientists. But then when we get into other areas like analysts and business users, right, seeking to understand, you know, uh, uh, new insights or, or new capabilities within, uh, 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 within the information infrastructure for the organization, they too are going to have those same kind of needs from the, uh, uh, the big data IT people, from the data lake folks, as well as from the data scientists. And what we believe there is that consistency of, uh, of development uh, and of model is what is the, uh, lays the core foundation for those knowledge graphs that we'll talk about in a second. And then as likewise, as the business uh, uh, drivers become more and more aware of the connectedness of their data, and the uh, uh, opportunities that they may have for uh, uh, building new innovative capabilities, identifying new business opportunities, et cetera, or uh, popular these days is you know, embarking upon digital transformation initiatives. We think that there's another loop that involves those business analysts, the data that's available to them, 
and the off the chief officers of whatever initiative happens to be you know next on the uh, 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 in the front of mind, uh, you know uh, chief officers of things like compliance, of data or data governance, of digital transformation, uh, chief information officers, chief uh, risk and security officers. All of those folks who are responsible for uh, embarking on major changes to the organization in, uh, in in this age of connections, we think that that again that's another area where uh, uh, graphs can play uh, very very heavily within the organization. So very quickly, some of the use cases that 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 we see in the uh, in the space. Customer engagement or customer, uh, uh, many of these are, are metadata related. So what lives in the data lake or what uh, 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 what describes your customer journey might be the customer engagement side. Uh, Real-time recommendations for, uh, for retailers or for uh, supplying pricing or for uh, identifying uh, you know, new, new types of opportunities or new connections. Those are, are very, very popular. Detecting money flow uh, sets of issues as well as uh, um, understanding how uh, how things are flowing is a uh, 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 in the fraud detection space is very popular. Um, understanding the connectedness of very large networks, whether that's telco networks, whether that's cloud networks, whether that's core IT networks, but this network management uh, uh, capability is very popular. Um, dynamic pricing I kind of covered under real time. Uh, artificial intelligence and IoT applications is. And you know, are arguably an extension of that network management devices that are making new uh, uh, new pieces of information are indeed uh, able to compound all of that and make uh, 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 use graph as a, as a vehicle for identifying opportunities for connections and then making those connections uh, directly themselves. And identity and uh, security, identity and access management is a big one. Supply chain is a, is also a big one. Samples of, of what these look like, just to again get you familiar with the look and feel of what a graph uh, uh, can look like, whether it's an org structure, uh, identity and access management using uh, uh, different uh, uh, software and access rights or groups, or that network and IT operation, different perspectives of the same kind of uh, uh, sets of information here. So now, I now let's get to the meat of the, what we want to talk about today. Let's talk about knowledge graphs. And the core knowledge graph problem is really one of, you know, how, how do you maintain your institutional memory, right, when, uh, uh, when things around you are changing on such an enormous kind of basis? So our organizations are having difficulty maintaining this memory, right, because your growth drivers are, you know, driving need for new and or continuous education amongst your, your, your people as well as your, uh, your business processes. That digitization and, and uh, digital transformation initiatives are attempting to identify new markets, um, but then you 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 uh, uh, run into issues of turnover, where you know the the folks who knew how things were done previously they leave, um, and then your aging infrastructures. Of course, the systems that you're using today are not necessarily what you want to be using in the future as a vehicle for maintaining this kind of corporate memory or. Uh, uh, this institutional knowledge uh, 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 for the organization as you want to drive it forward. The downside of, you know, if, if we're not able to address these is this, you know, lack of knowledge sharing. It's, it, it slows down projects. Um, it, uh, you know, creates inconsistencies even, you know, amongst your, your, your core team members. Uh, our old favorite Donald Rumsfeld line of uh, organizations don't know what they don't know, and nor do they even know what they do know in many cases. And it's this graphy idea is what oftentimes reveals the connectedness of information that you may not have readily have seen uh, you know, is related to each other in, uh, in other forms. Um, it's difficult for uh, organization, uh, organizational alignment, data scientists to be aligned with other parts of the organization in, uh, uh, in identifying new opportunities and then uh, ideally be, being able to act on them in a time, timely manner. Uh, there's a lot of the age-old uh, issues around uh, uh, data silos or data centrality or you know single versions of truth kinds of uh, 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 kinds of situations that uh, even dating back 20, 30 years ago of data warehousing and its promises of finding a single you know, and creating a single uh, location for where information is supposed to live and thrive, etc. Um, uh, those are all continuing to be core sets of issues 
in this quest for uh, maintaining and developing a, a, a knowledge graph itself. So let's look a little bit deeper into you know, a, 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 some of these core sets of issues. And I'm gonna just use a very, uh, let's call it very traditional kinds of, uh, 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 kinds of graphics for this, including uh, you know, the age old problem of, of your customer silos and, and where things happen to live within the enterprise. And I like, to, I like to use this particular model here because it's identifying um, two sets of very, uh, of somewhat related, but, but oftentimes uh, uh, very distinct sets of information like uh, products on the left-hand side, the things that I build, the business processes I, I operate my business around, and then who I offer those products to. What's my customer experience, my customer journey, what happens to them when they uh, uh, engage with me. And oftentimes we end up buying or, 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 uh, or building different uh, operational systems that indeed support part of these different business processes, whether it's handling purchases, maintaining the product catalog, maintaining a, a uh, my different, you know, my user reviews or my, uh, uh, you know, how I present my products, maintaining my information about uh, store purchases, shopping carts, et cetera, right? All of these can be stored even in different technology types. If you, uh, if you look at the, uh, the types of information that are, that's getting represented here. And then, you know, if I've got an in-store purchase, uh, you know, that goes into one piece of, you know, uh, one silo, a user review might go into a document store as a different uh, repository for information. So very difficult to have an understanding of, you know, why something was bought, what a user felt about that, that uh, particular activity, and then, uh, you know, what was the impact on my organization as part of that purchase. So if we start to look at these different silos and, and really start to, you know, the, the, the goal of building a data lake around all of this is super appealing. Let's get everything and let's continue that uh, warehouse-ish mentality, but on a vast scale and consolidate all of this information into, uh, uh, into a data lake. Let's say I've, I've got my, my big Hadoop system. I'm uh, going to trick it out with Spark. I'm going to trick it out with Elasticsearch. I'm going to do all kinds of really clever things within the database. Or within the data lake itself, it's great for you know core sets of analytics, uh, neatening up my log structures, neatening up my file structures, being able to uh, perform everyday kind of uh, uh, business intelligence activities, or perhaps write MapReduce uh, uh, functions that are gathering up and trying to consolidate lots of this information. But the downside still is it it's not necessarily great for operationalizing or using or putting into action the the insights that you might draw from a data lake uh, and of course the, the the batch nature of uh, these kinds of activities in many in many forms uh, doesn't make it relevant you know, doesn't make it appropriate for uh, creating things in, in core real-time kinds of uh, uh, information so if I use that same purchase activity kind of uh, 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 mindset and and say you know what I really want is I want to create better context for my customer experience and sell them exactly the right product at the exactly the right time so a recommendation uh, you know which is arguably an operational workflow has a lot of information that it can draw from this overall now body of knowledge if I can indeed tap into that at the appropriate time so what we end up uh, uh, proposing to our uh, to our customers is, you know, you taking the relevant pieces of information out of each one of these different silos, and indeed creating out of that what we'll call the nodes and relationships of that of those sets of information, whether it's purchase data, product data, the uh, uh, the different views of you know, perhaps the product catalog user responses, uh, act in-store activity, the, the ledger, uh, or you know, even shopping cart activity, and build a graph out of that. And materializing a graph out of all of this core sets of information is, is actually not that, not terribly difficult, especially in the age now of the platform environment that I mentioned earlier. So we do, we, we offer capabilities in, in the world of data integration, for example, that allow you to take data out of a relational database and distill it into a graph very, very easily simply by uh, understanding how uh, a relationship in a graph is manifested by uh, materializing one or many, one or more joins across uh, or within a relational database. So if I'm able to uh, um, perhaps 
prepare the relational data in such a way that um, it is uh, 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 creating, let's say, node labels as core sets of tables, or you know, a, a node might be a row of information in a table, and then relating that to other other nodes in some form as a join or as a uh, 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 or as uh, uh, foreign key relationships. Very very easy to turn that into what is in essence, you know, turn that into a graph that can be stored and executed within Neo4j. Well, the same holds true in the big data space, is we can distill graphs from CSV files, we can distill graphs from uh, 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 parsed log files, we can distill graphs from other types of systems, and you know, ultimately reveal those, the connectedness of those relationships within uh, uh, within Neo4j and, 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 and do so and be able to uh, query all of this information in real time in order to drive my next generation set of applications, right? Those transformative applications, whether they are mobile shopping cart, whether they are real-time shipping, whether they are things like uh, uh, you know, institutional memory, as, as we've been talking about, of, uh, uh, or revealing how accounts and people and, uh, uh, and money flow are related, all of those are great, great uh, uh, graph type applications. So let's look at you know kind of our simple enterprise knowledge graph as, as we look at this. We'll pick up uh, customer information, um, customers you know, where they are, how to contact them. Uh, we'll call that the customer graph, and then we'll pick up product information, the stuff that we're manufacturing. They have they live in categories X and Y. We'll call that the product graph, and then we can you know our our vehicles for how we bring this information to market. Uh, that's going to be our supply graph or you know, how we're actually getting our products out there in the market. So I have these three distinct kind of areas right now, but I can start to uh, understand and recognize how these indeed are going to interrelate when I you know, really start to think about how a customer is going to approach a product. Are they going to have an in-store experience? Are they going to have an online experience? Those activities are you know, help, help me dictate and connect these different uh, originally distinct graphs into a, sing a singular enterprise knowledge graph. And as all of this information builds up over time, the customer themselves, you can, you can imagine their uh, different relationships amongst you know, different types of customers may be revealed, uh, different relationships amongst uh, 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 you know, the devices that they might be carrying or amongst uh, 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 family members that they may be uh, 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 that they may be related to, all of that information can be indeed uh, uh, both revealed and then persisted within a knowledge graph such that uh, you can build up better and better context about the desires of any singular customer simply based on you know, behaviors that you might uh, uh, collect and track uh, uh, over time. So this, uh, you know, ultimately allows you to unlock that that core institutional memory and do really clever things with it, whether that's deliver them the right kind of product as they need it, whether that's alert them that uh, uh, there's been wonky activity happening in their bank accounts, uh, alert them that your uh, your Amazon shipment might be late by a day because of uh, some uh, um, unanticipated uh, uh, weird event, or that you know there may be other risks involved in uh, you know, weather-related risks or something like that in the, you know, the delivery of a product to a, a particular facility. So all of those give us ways in which to not only react in, in real time to existing conditions, but build up more and more connectedness and more and more knowledge over time as, uh, 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 as the graph itself grows. So ultimately how you know, these knowledge graphs ought to be uh, uh, behaving is uh, this core information, especially in, in the world of analytics or research departments, they, you know, all of this should be have searchable content. It should have a, a very consistent repository and ont uh, an ontology, if you will, or uh, uh, in uh, if if we get into uh, the RDF side of graphs, uh, or you know, some kind of representation of a repository from which to store and draw and maintain and persist this institutional knowledge. Right? Organizations who do this, right, maintain a knowledge graph, will indeed have higher degrees of consistency across, you know not only some of the areas of their business, but all areas of their business, because they'll re they will begin to really truly understand how all of these, uh, their, their business processes interact, how everything's connected to everything else. 
So what we need to get there is really this notion of uh, uh, and a mentality around building and returning context uh, all the time. This institutional memory requires, uh, you know, this uh, uh, integration of these diverse data sets. But our whole goal here is to develop that that set of context for any of these uh, uh, any of these relationships, um, cause and effect correlations, uh, and, and, and any of these kinds of situations. We want to persist and materialize these relationships on a permanent basis. Because what's really interesting is, of course, even if you just think about it, relationships themselves do actually have a lifespan uh, and, and they change over time. And understanding how those things might change over time, like today, uh, I, I, uh, uh, as I meant, you know, I'm losing my train of thought, uh, relationships indeed can change over time. Uh, now, when we look at this kind of solution, oftentimes it involves text-based activity, so natural language processing and you know, ways in which to get text information into a graph or in, into one of these repositories. It involves, elast you know, oftentimes a technology very popular to use here is Elasticsearch. Uh, and using Elasticsearch here is really a, a means to find the entry point into the graph from which you want to traverse. So you might use Elasticsearch to identify the drop-in locations of, of where a particular index in the graph happens to live, and then traverse the graph around there to illustrate that, 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 that context around that, uh, that drop-in point. So let's look at some, you know, kind of the architecture of, of, of this kind of activity, is we might have uh, a, a situation where uh, we have our customers, they might be transferring money, they might be making purchases, they might be uh, uh, doing other activities. Those are, that, Transactional information is getting logged by our relational systems, by our stores, et cetera, gets moved into the, 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 the data lake and the searchable environment. Um, and as I said, the, the, using Elasticsearch sets context for graph-based traversals of information uh, that would be put into Neo4j. The data science team can help develop patterns of what to look for when you're actually performing these traversals, what, you know, what things are indeed related to other things. How many uh, accounts or how many companies, how many shell companies is this uh, one uh, 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 company uh, managing or overseeing? How many boards of directors is you know, the, uh, 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 the commerce secretary a, a member of? Those kind of activities are things that uh, even the, uh, uh, the Paradise Papers are revealing today. But then we use that real-time traversal information to actually provide real uh, you know, uh, uh, sensing you know, the, the reaction to a transaction stream as well as a, an appropriate response or recommendation or whatever that uh, alert notification might be after traversing the graph, applying that context and uh, coming up with a particular uh, uh, answer. Now where this ultimately can, can end up leading is this idea around knowledge graphs being a foundation for artificial intelligent activities. Uh, like uh, uh, a graph-based, uh, uh, this, this foundation you know, is, as, as I mentioned earlier, uh, can be because our data science teams are building new contexts and new uh, uh, iterations from, uh, uh, from within their graph analytics. They can um, operationalize and, and, and execute uh, uh, more, more real-time kinds of capabilities of you know, uh, put in new sensing uh, uh, algorithms and new sensing capabilities for things like uh, uh, recommendations that we should be making in the future based on information that the application acquires today. Uh, whether it's uh, uh, this AI visibility, creating things that are human friendly and, and, and realizing that as graph, that's actually a reference to how uh, using a deep neural network a, a kind of application might help explain how and where uh, uh, the decision-making process uh, happens within a graph or within this neural network and expose that so you can actually see or visualize the thought process going on. So as I wrap or as, as I get closer to, uh, to coming in, I want to actually put this all back into real perspective by talking about different organizations who are indeed uh, uh, building out knowledge graphs and what they're doing with it and why this, you know, creating and developing this, this core knowledge over time is so indeed important. So uh, first customer I, I want to describe is uh, Itaú Unibanco. This is Brazil's largest bank or South America's largest bank. 
um, they are they're issuing and they have uh, they're maintaining millions of credit card and debit card kind of accounts. Their issue that they see is that they ex they do experience right now, or they want to reduce the amount of uh, fraudulent uh, account activity, fraudulent account activity, uh, creation activity that's happening within their networks, and they want to uh, uh, improve that sensitivity to uh, to fraud detection. Um, they need to do this. You know, within mobile, they need it to be real time, and they need to enable uh, thousands of analysts uh, 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 to support this kind of uh, this this kind of application, um, so that they can be very very responsive to, uh, uh, to to legitimate customers. So what they're building is a credit monitoring and fraud detection kind of application. They're evaluating credit worthiness of of applicants. Uh, it's a simple graph, right? It's, it starts out with 4.2 uh, million nodes, but it's got about 4 billion relationships built into that. Uh, uh, and what they want to ultimately end up growing this graph to is 93 trillion sets of relationships and paths amongst each other. So what they're really trying to develop is situations where if uh, uh, one uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 fraud actor uh, how frequently do they hang out with other fraud actors and where can I find them? Are they doing transactions in particular locations like their favorite watering hole? Those kind of activities are what they're trying to do. I tell us trying to, to trying to develop so that they can indeed weed out the uh, 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 the bad apples and, and more appropriately serve their key customers. UBS is doing a very similar activity here with uh, uh, across 12 different data domains they've, uh, and 400 data, uh, data integration points to create a, a, a very complex data management kind of exercise and data management uh, um, infrastructure. So building out a, a, a master data kind of uh, uh, data integration vehicle or platform um, to make sure that, that data flow is consistent that it, uh, across departments, across uh, uh, from from consumers into the bank as well as uh, uh, back out again, and make uh, uh, redundant activities go away and disappear so that they can serve customers in a more effective manner. So their whole goal was to uh, to build out a, a a metadata model that's governing all of the activities around uh, around their business processes. And in doing so, they're uh, improving not only their their governance activities that you know of regulations that they have to adhere to, but they're improving the trust uh, amongst themselves within departments and trust amongst themselves and uh, uh, and, and customers directly. So they they've created better service levels here. They've created better uh, relationships overall with uh, with external customers by improving the way data flows within their organization. There's another one of my favorite ones is Airbnb's data portal. Uh, this uh, this activity is uh, uh, a, a data consolidation and data reuse uh, um, a knowledge graph that uh, uh, allows their 3,000 uh, uh, different uh, 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 data analysts and, and, and folks using and consuming information to have a very, very consistent set of information that they're going after. So they wanted that core consistency and that institutional knowledge about where core, you know, core pieces of information happens to live, who the accessors of that information happen to be, who creates a piece of content, uh, like a, a graphic or a, a, a table or a chart. In this case, the, the, the diagram shows in Tableau. And then where that information flows, where it goes, who's using it, what's redundant, uh, um, what's popular, what's antiquated, uh, all of those activities are managed through this uh, knowledge graph. And uh, it has, is eliminating a lot of their, uh, a lot of the bottlenecks they found when, uh, when they were evaluating, you know, how come one organization or one department knows more about this stuff than other departments of, you know, uh, in, uh, perhaps in, in different locations. And it was because information sharing was, was, uh, um, was not as efficient as it could have been. So this knowledge graph, the data portal uh, activity has dramatically improved uh, uh, all of that. And they've deployed, as I mentioned before, that Neo4j, they have a repository that they, they uh, uh, access by Elasticsearch, uh, and they're using Python uh, among uh, uh, a variety of other technologies, including, including Tableau, including uh, 
uh, their other core sets of, uh, of infrastructure to help drive and build this uh, particular knowledge graph. Novartis's knowledge graph is actually uh, uh, built around uh, their biomedical research and what they're trying to do is uh, navigate more than 25 million um, uh, medical research papers and create a, a knowledge base of all of that information sourced from the, the National Library of Research and then use that use information gleaned from all of those different research papers to see if there is affinity where you know automating this uh, phenotype a compound and protein cell behavior within cells a phenotype a, a drug or drug compound and its its reaction expected behavior when it reacts to uh, uh, cell proteins to see if there's a way to expedite you know, future research what what should they be doing there um, should they uh, 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 mining for you know common DNA strings, mining, mining for uh, uh, common proteins, RNA, et cetera? All of these were uh, things that they're trying to develop consistency models around, so that they don't have to go and retest and revalidate uh, uh, activities that uh, that have already taken place in the past. Uh, and all of this is their goal is to expedite. Uh, new research and, and make uh, new research um, uh, better informed. Uh, Columbia Research is, uh, uh, Columbia University is part of the uh, uh, investigative journalism uh, uh, sets of activities, and they too are using documents from ICIJ, from LexisNexis, from uh, uh, publicly available via Google, uh, Bloomberg, et cetera, and uh, uh, feeding this into their um, uh, their own uh, investigation graph and identify you know, and, and what they're trying to identify here are perhaps business relationships amongst individuals holdings accounts etc uh, similar to what uh, ICIJ has just released and you look at you know are there different name variations look at different uh, uh, connections between different people or uh, documents themselves and all of this is geared around uh, supporting the story discovery phase of their work, right? Who should I go talk to and what should I ask them about is really the questions they're trying to uncover and they're using Neo4j as the vehicle from, you know, born from documents that they've acquired to identify new paths of investigation to pursue. In the uh, 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 IoT space or smart home space, we have a number of customers that are doing uh, uh, using knowledge graphs as a vehicle for driving, uh, you know, new sets of home-centric behavior. Um, so Teliazone is, is is one of them. We also have Comcast is another uh, uh, customer doing a very similar uh, activity of building smart homes that uh, not only uh, uh, do clever things like uh, set your thermostat, but also are aware of who's in the house and who's not in the house, are aware of um, what friends or what visitors you might have in the house that uh, uh, and, and what information they could they could provide as a uh, uh, as a smart application. Uh, what Telly has built is an interesting one. Is this uh, Spotify playlist based on who's you know, who's roaming about the house? So imagine your children have their friends over. They can create a uh, 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 the the Telly Zone application can actually create a uh, a custom playlist based on all the kids and all the MAC addresses from their phones. And their own Spotify playlists uh, and, and assemble the party playlist, for example. Uh, or you can, uh, uh, they can be, uh, the, the system can identify parents when your kids get home, or they can identify, they can let you know when you uh, left the garage door uh, uh, up, right, because uh, uh, as you pulled out of the driveway. All of those kinds of activities are um, smart home related, but are also feeding this overall core knowledge graph that. Uh, uh, that, that Telly is creating that is building out information about each household and about the the uh, the, the nuances or the the contexts of each member of each household as it uh, uh, as it persists. Another one of these uh, that is a uh, uh, similar in nature, Scripps Network, is uh, uh, got a knowledge graph that is uh, uh, basically performing asset management capabilities. This is uh, these are the guys who make. Uh, the television programming and the, the different uh, uh, networks like Food Network or Home and Garden TV or the Cooking Channel and Travel Channel, et cetera. 
Uh, and what they're doing is they're looking at all of the interconnectedness of different assets, like uh, how many times does Rachel Ray show up on somebody else's episode of Cooking Channel? Or does, uh, does she show up in Travel Channel snippets and, and, uh, um, uh, uh, and events kind of thing? So uh, their overall asset management, they, they want to help determine what are indeed the most popular shows, what are the most uh, uh, vital assets? What are popular um, recipes that are getting uh, getting produced? All of these are, are different areas where the longer that this asset management uh, uh, environment is uh, is in play, the smarter, more intelligent content they can actually build uh, subsequently from that by exploiting you know the very very popular actors and celebrities that they have on their networks, the very popular destinations and meals at those destinations. Uh, 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 and, and how they're all interrelated. Uh, Pitney Bowes is creating a great uh, uh, master data management and uh, uh, knowledge development uh, uh, customer 360 kind of kind of application. Um, uh, again, all based on, uh, very similar to what we saw at uh, uh, at UBS as well as ITAO as well as uh, uh, some of these other examples that I've been describing of you know understanding that core customer journey whether it's uh, you know what they're buying, what their behaviors are, what they did last week, and what they might do in the future uh, as a, a core uh, uh, embedded knowledge graph. And finally, uh, we've got uh, University of Washington. Those guys are uh, have, have moved their uh, environment from uh, they, they embarked upon a, a, a an information migration activity. Uh, a cloud transformation activity, moving from PeopleSoft to Workday. Uh, and of course, they're a gargantuan university uh, in terms of size. And not only are they you know, just a school, but they run six different hospitals, right? They have three different campuses. They have you know, IT staff and 80,000 students and employees at any given time that they, they have to take care of. Um, and what they're trying to ultimately do is move from this older system seamlessly without uh, without any breakage to a cloud-based workday system. It's a billion dollar project, right? It's really, really big. So what they did is they uh, uh, built their own core knowledge graph and uh, for er any given data element, they were moving from the older system to the new and defining the lineage and, and defining the uh, uh, migration vehicle and migration points for for that information as they moved it over and did it you know very methodically for uh, uh, these uh, uh, over you know, 6,300 different data warehouse users who are you know looking at all the information while it's in uh, 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 in play. So the overall the again here lots of the information they were looking at they they built out with Elasticsearch as the you know, uh, the Find My Index vehicle. And then Neo4j as the vehicle to traverse all of that and understand what's related to it and what might break or what might be uh, uh, susceptible to PII exposure if it was the hospital data um, as they move it from one system to the next. Marriott's doing a pricing example. And my favorite one as I conclude and wind down on our event today, the one I really want to talk about is my favorite eBay shop bot as you know, kind of the core, the quintessential knowledge graph use case at, at the moment. So ShopBot is a personal shopping assistant. And what it is, is it allows a, a user or customer to converse using Facebook Messenger, and then, and then in the future using things like Slack and other messaging applications to converse with eBay, the store, and figure out what their particular shopping needs might happen to be. So it's, a, uh, it, it's the first of uh, uh, many in eBay's uh, uh, artificial intelligence uh, group and their their AI platform, and their uh, 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 it combines you know, their AI knowledge with their natural language understanding activity of parsing the text of what somebody's saying, and then using Neo4j as the, the uh, uh, context delivery vehicle or identification vehicle for what the bot itself should ask or should say to the uh, to the requester as it uh, uh, as it converses with the uh, with the shopper so it's uh, you know it's a modest application three developers eight million nodes 20 million relationships uh, they need it to be very live and very very responsive and they need it to learn as it goes 
So let's look at kind of some of the things that it's doing. You can actually say, you know, log into to, uh, uh, through Messenger. You say, hey, ShopBot, let, let's uh, uh, start a conversation. I'm looking for you know, a black bag uh, for under 80 bucks. And uh, uh, what eBay, ShopBot will then ask is, you know, what kind of bag are you looking for? Is it a, a unisex bag like a backpack or is it a handbag or a purse? And then you can say, well, what I was, you know, uh, I want a unisex bag, like a backpack, and I want it to look like this. And you can even supply a picture of what uh, 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 of what it wants. And e eBay Shopbot will will return back, you know, its suggestions of what uh, uh, what it might be uh, offering you or might be able to offer you. So you know, in another case, you can say, well, I want to find if I delivered a picture, I want to say I want to find these kind of um, sunglasses, career sunglasses, you know, because my friend has them. So you take a picture of your friend's glasses. And it'll it'll come back and look for a product that is uh, uh, nearly identical to uh, to that, and maybe give you uh, some options for frame color or choice uh, kind of preference. Now, what's happening under the covers here when you start to parse all of this, uh, the the language and the information that it's keeping track of, it's looking for things like attributes about the product, the type of item. It wants a messenger bag. Do you want, you know, what kind of brand is it coming from? Is there a material or a color preference that the, the, the user has? And then, of course, is there a budget that the, uh, uh, that the customer happens to have? Well, in the knowledge graph that it's looking at, right, there's different categorizations of different products. And as it's going through here, it first focuses on, it says, oh, I, okay, I understand. I'm looking for a bag. And then and it triggers the next closest relationships are what type of bag and path should I follow? Should I go to the, the left-hand side and go for men's backpacks? Or should I go to the right-hand side for handbags of, of different types? And it's figuring out that kind of traversal logic and the next best question to ask the, uh, uh, the buyer as it looks at the different types of inventory it's ha it happens to be managing. Now, at the same time, it's also collecting information and remembering information about the customer themselves, the shopper. So the, the example I like to use is uh, uh, when I went off and uh, was looking for uh, uh, baseball equipment, uh, I, I was shopping for a first baseman's mitt. And I happen to be left-handed, so that's a good left-handed uh, uh, person's position. So it knows, and, you know, because I was doing this years ago, that uh, I'm a southpaw. So now when I go and look for golf clubs, at this, you know, the, likewise, I want lefty clubs and, I, and, and ShopBot is actually remembering that particular personal attribute about myself that if, uh, uh, historically that, uh, so that it's presenting me proper products uh, you know, in, in the future. And it's doing that for things like uh, my shoe size, my, uh, you know, my collar size for, for clothing, um, my color preferences for you know what uh, what what colors I, I tend to, uh, to to gravitate towards what materials if it's cl uh, additional clothing I, I tend to gravitate towards so all of that context it's actually developing over time about me and then when it figures out that I'm actually buying birthday gifts for my children right it then remembers okay I'm a parent who has you know, uh, holiday anniversaries or anniversaries that are important to me because they're the birthdays of my kids, and it remembers that information as well. And as we were talking about earlier, that loop between development of adding information to a graph, adding or expanding the connectedness of the graph, forces a, a, a need to rethink some of the algorithms that are operating upon it or feeding the graph. And some of those algorithms not, not only uh, would be things like, What's the you know what is the most central type of you know, handbag or topic I can I can navigate to as a as a uh, uh, cent centrality algorithm, but then it's also looking for what connections should I be adding if I see, depending on the response of the customer. So if the customer says birthday, I want to add in who's the birthday for and make the connection the real you know the the real relationship the human relationship between. The, the the recipient and the the person I have you know, uh, and, and myself shopping for a gift so that kind of knowledge is what's building up inside of uh, eBay shopbot that kind of knowledge is what's building up in many of these knowledge graph kinds of applications and for that I hope uh, everybody enjoyed the uh, uh, this discussion of knowledge graphs we'll